straight ahead on Law and Crime Daily. Bombshell test results out of Wisconsin. Someone essential to the proceedings has tested positive. I do have to suspend our proceedings for a period of time. What's next in the trial of Chandler Holderson as a defendant tests positive for COVID-19. And developments in state and federal cases for the three former officers involved in the arrest and murder of George Floyd. Plus, Prince Andrew is headed to federal court. A judge rules it's too soon to dismiss sexual assault allegations against the Duke of York. But first, a plea is entered for accused Michigan school shooter, 15-year-old Ethan Crumbly. I would waive the formal reading, stand my client mute, ask that I'm not. Law and Crime Daily, I'm Brian Buckmeyer along with Terry Austin. Accused Michigan school shooter Ethan Crumbly appears in court virtually, entering a not guilty plea in the case. 15-year-old Crumbly faces multiple charges, including terrorism causing death, first-degree murder, and assault with intent to murder for the Oxford High School shooting in November of last year. Officials say Crumbly opened fire at the school, killing four students and injuring eight others. Prosecutors say his parents, Jennifer and James Crumbly, ignored warning signs leading up to the shooting. They face four counts of involuntary manslaughter. On Wednesday, Ethan Crumbly appeared in court virtually, where defense attorneys waived a formal reading of the charges and entered a not guilty plea on his behalf. After that, presiding Judge Kwame Rowe addressed COVID-19 concerns as a deadline for Crumbly's placement as a juvenile looms in the coming weeks. It's my understanding that according to the Juvenile Justice and Delinquency Prevention Act, that a hearing must be held before January 21st of 2022 regarding the placement of the defendant. However, because of the pandemic, we cannot effectuate an in-person hearing, um, which I believe it would be appropriate in this case because of the high number of COVID cases, a positivity rate in Oakland County. Um, because the number of COVID cases are so high at this time, the court is finding good cause to extend those 30 days um, because we cannot effectuate an in-person hearing at this time due to the positivity rates. It's my understanding that uh, defense is requesting in-person, and I believe that is absolutely it, uh, appropriate in this matter. Judge Rowe ordered attorneys to submit briefs on Crumbly's placement. He also set a January 19th status conference for attorneys, when both sides will determine a later date for a hearing on Crumbly's placements. Joining us today is criminal defense attorney Taylor Koss and Terry Austin. Taylor, what does a hearing for placement entail, and what is the defense aiming for? Uh, thanks for having me, guys. So in this case, even though uh, the defendant is being tried as an adult, He's still only 15 years old, and as a result of that, and as a result of the statute that the judge just referenced uh, in, in that speech he was giving before, uh, they have to conduct a hearing on where he will be placed. And what that means is what facility is he going to be held in? Is he going to continue to be held in the county jail where adults are held, or is he going to be moved to the children's village where uh, juvenile delinquents are held? And the defense clearly wants him to be moved to the juvenile facility for a variety of reasons. I'm sure they will harp on his safety and welfare. He is a young child, even though he did actions and acted like an adult, only 15 years old. And for him to be housed with adults of all ages, particularly uh, with the crime that he's committed, his attorneys will argue that he's going to be a target and that his safety is at risk. So what they're hoping for is that the judge agrees with this line and shifts him over to the children's village where his, you know, they believe that they can handle him in a better way, protect him in a better way, and make him less of a target considering everybody else around him will also be a child. Makes sense. Terry, on the civil side of this tragedy, cases are ramping up against the Oxford School as plaintiffs are saying many red flags were ignored. What were they, and do they make for strong claims? Well, I do think they make for strong claims. There were a number of red flags, not the least of which we know he was seen looking for ammunition online. Apparently, he brought ammo to the school. He also, weeks before, put a bird's head in a jar and brought that to school. So the question is whether or not the school should have known better and whether or not they acted reasonably. And of course, in hindsight, clearly they did not act enough. Yeah. And right there, you just saw some photos of uh, some evidence that was put in, that being Ethan Crumbly's work assignments. And you saw some more red flags that should have been caught by the school. Now on to news out of Colorado, where prosecutors say they could call up to 500 witnesses in the coming trial of accused wife killer Barry Morphew. This comes after a new judge is appointed in the case when Judge Patrick Murphy recused himself, 
The move followed a request by the defense to remove Judge Murphy based on a previous ruling that he was biased or prejudiced towards the defense attorney representing Morphew's girlfriend. 51-year-old Shoshana Darkey was arrested in September after she was found trespassing at Morphew's former residence. Morphew is charged with the 2020 death of his wife, Suzanne, who was last seen on Mother's Day of that year. Though a body has never been found, Colorado police say Suzanne Morphew is presumed dead. Morphew is set to appear in court virtually on Tuesday for a status conference. And in New Hampshire, missing seven-year-old Harmony Montgomery's stepmother faces new charges as she's set to face a judge on Thursday. Kayla Montgomery allegedly claimed the missing girl on her food stamp benefits. She is now charged with a different felony than she was first charged with, theft by deception and two misdemeanor counts of acts prohibited for welfare fraud. Kayla is estranged from her husband, Adam, who had custody of his daughter, Harmony. Harmony's mother, Crystal Sori, says she last saw her daughter on a video call near Easter in 2019. But Harmony wasn't reported missing until last month. Over the weekend, investigators searched the home where the seven-year-old lived with her father. He was arrested on charges related to her disappearance. He faces a second-degree assault charge for allegedly punching Harmony in the eye in 2019, among other charges. The reward for information about her whereabouts has reached $100,000. And the Tiger King reality star expects to receive less prison time for his crimes at a resentencing hearing scheduled for the end of the month. Joe Exotic, whose real name is Joseph Maldonado of Passage, is currently serving 22 years in prison for selling exotic animals, killing tigers, and falsifying wildlife records. He is also convicted of a murder-for-hire plot against wildlife activist Carol Baskin in 2020. In July, an appeals court ruled that Joe Exotic should have only been sentenced to a maximum of 21 years and 10 months. In addition to Joe Exotic's case, the Department of Justice recently announced that the couple who took over Exotic's animal park are permanently banned from exhibiting animals. In November of 2020, the DOJ filed a complaint against Jeffrey and Lauren Lowe, saying they were violating the Endangered Species Act. In late December, after the Lowe's violated a preliminary injunction order several times, Nearly 100 endangered or threatened animals were seized from the facility. Still ahead on Law & Crime Daily, a judge denies the motion to dismiss Prince Andrew's federal sex crimes trial. But first, the state trial could be pushed back in the case of three former Minnesota officers involved in the death of George Floyd. All that and more after the break. Hi, this is Dan Abrams with exciting news for all of our Law & Crime followers on YouTube. You can now get the live Law & Crime Network with YouTube TV for all of your daily live trial coverage, legal news, expert analysis, and original true crime programs. Subscribe to YouTube TV today and then locate Law & Crime in the channel guide. And for only $1.99 a month, you can add the network to your bundle. Watch Law & Crime every day with YouTube TV. We put you in the jury box. Welcome back to Law & Crime Daily. The state trial for three former Minnesota police officers involved in George Floyd's death will likely be delayed after the court grants a continuance motion. On Tuesday, the court granted a request made by all parties to continue the trial of Thomas Lane, J. Alexander King, and Tu Tao a later, to a later date. The motion was granted with specifications that all parties must agree on a new trial date by Saturday and communicate it to the court by Sunday. If a new date has not been reported to court by Sunday, the trial date will remain March 7th. Earlier this week, Judge Peter Cahill ruled video and audio recordings and live streams will be allowed for the state trial. Meanwhile, a federal trial for all three former officers is scheduled to begin next week. The ex-cops and Derek Chauvin were all indicted by a federal grand jury last year for allegedly depriving Floyd of his civil rights on May 25th, 2020. That day, Chauvin murdered Floyd when he held him face down on a ground, handcuffed. Chauvin was convicted of Floyd's death in June. In December, he pled guilty to the federal civil rights charges. Let's bring back criminal defense attorney Taylor Koss and Terry Austin to discuss the latest in the three former officers charged with violating George Floyd's civil rights. Terry, is there any uh, significance that the federal case will be tried before the state case? Could this be an intentional move by the defense? 
I think it was a great move by the defense. I think the federal case is going to be more difficult to prove against Lane Tao and King. The criminal case is fairly straightforward. The question really is, did they use reasonable force? And so for that, they just have to look at whether or not Tao, for instance, he was holding the crowd back. Did he act reasonably under these circumstances? King, he had his knee on George Floyd's back. Was that reasonable? Should he have stopped? And Lane had his knee on the legs of George Floyd. So those are all questions I think a jury can answer quickly. The federal case is a little bit more difficult and more complicated. I think the question there is whether or not these three officers deprived George Floyd of his constitutional rights. So I think at the end of the day, it made more sense for the defense to try to put off the criminal case and to have the federal case go forward versus the state case. Now, Taylor, is the federal case against these three former officers just going to be a repeat of the Chauvin trial? Or do you think we will hear more and even different facts about this case? So I think at its core, it's going to be a repeat. But when you get out from the core and you start expanding, you realize uh, that the subject matter in the federal trial is broader. Uh, it's not as specific and it's not as simple as did A do B. You know, it's did these people work together in, in, in a goal to deprive a human being of his civil rights? It's a different standard. Uh, it's different elements. And I anticipate information uh, and evidence being heard by that jury that has never been heard before by the Chauvin jury and would likely not be heard in the state criminal matter. All right. Unfortunately, we won't actually physically hear it because it's a federal court case. And so we can't put cameras in there, but we'll be here at Law and Crime Daily to give you that gavel to gavel coverage when that federal trial does begin. Thank you both. Coming up on Law and Crime Daily, Wisconsin defendant tests positive for COVID-19 as he stands trial for the murder of his parents. Plus, Prince Andrew is headed to federal court. Why a judge says it's too soon to dismiss the sex crimes trial. Welcome back. Federal prosecutors say they will drop perjury charges against former British socialite Ghislaine Maxwell if her recent conviction sticks. Prosecutors say it's to avoid the victims from having to testify and go through that trauma again. Maxwell was the former girlfriend of Jeffrey Epstein. A jury convicted her last month on five of six sex crime counts, including sex trafficking of a minor. Prosecutors say she and Epstein worked together to groom young girls for sexual abuse. The perjury charges stem from a 2016 deposition on a civil case where Maxwell was accused of lying. Those charges were to be handled in a separate trial. Prosecutors say they will dismiss them if the defense's post-trial motions are denied. After the federal sex crimes trial, it came to light that one of the jurors who convicted her had been sexually abused and shared his story during deliberations. The defense says that should grant Maxwell a new trial based on a Supreme Court ruling on jurors failing to answer questionnaires honestly. And the connection to the Maxwell case, a sex assault lawsuit involving another person tied to Jeffrey Epstein, is moving forward as another attempt to get it thrown out fails. A judge has denied a motion to dismiss the suit against Prince Andrew, filed by Virginia Dufre, who is also an Epstein and Maxwell accuser. Dufre says the British royal sexually assaulted her when she was trafficked to him by Epstein and Maxwell when she was 17. Prince Andrew argued a 2009 settlement Dufre made with Epstein barred her from suing him. Dufre accepted a payout of $500,000 from Epstein and agreed it would be confidential. The agreement also protects, quote, other potential defendants. That settlement was reached a decade before Epstein was found dead in his jail cell. The lawsuit now moves into the discovery phase, which involves taking depositions. If the case is not settled, it could move to trial later this year. Let's bring back criminal defense attorney Taylor Koss and co-host Terry Austin to break down the latest in the Duke of York civil case. Terry, what does it mean that the defense didn't win their motion to dismiss, and does that tell us anything about the strength of Jufre's case? Well, it means the case will be allowed to go to trial. And the judge basically said that the complaint was not vague and that it was not ambiguous. It was enough to move forward. She specifically alleged some sexual abuse, and she identified specific locations, Virgin Islands, Manhattan, and London. So it shows that the case can go forward. But what it doesn't show, Brian, it doesn't say anything about the strength of the case itself. Now, Taylor, does this civil case ever going to end up in a trial? Uh, do you think we'll see Prince Andrew on U.S. soil for this case, or will motions or a potential settlement come up first? Uh, this will never, ever go to trial. If it does, there has been some sort of crazy uh, 
horrible lawyering. Um, he, he can't take that risk. The, the, the public relations nightmare that a trial would be for him, whether he's innocent or guilty, quite frankly, uh, is just a disaster for him and for the royal family. So whether this is based on subsequent motions or a sealed and closed settlement, this never sees the inside of a courtroom. Yeah, I, I agree with you, Taylor. I'll probably one-up you there as well. I don't even think he's going to sit down for a deposition because help him if those words ever see the, the, the sunlight or the day of anything. Um, like you said, the court of public opinion, I think, would destroy him absolutely. Thank you both. When we come back, the medical examiner is called to testify as a Wisconsin man stands trial for the murder and dismemberment of his parents. For lack of a better term, Mr. Halderson was shot in the back. That is correct. What gruesome details the medical examiner reveals in the dismembered parents' trial. That's next on Law and Crime Daily. Welcome back to Law and Crime Daily. Week two of a Wisconsin double homicide trial comes to a screeching halt when the defendant tests positive for COVID-19. After court adjourned on Tuesday, news broke that 23-year-old Chandler Halderson tested positive for the virus. This comes as the Dane County Jail, where Halderson is being held, reports a record number of COVID-19 cases. Halderson on, is on trial for the murder of his parents, 50-year-old Bart and 53-year-old Crystal Halderson, in July 2021. Prosecutors say Halderson cut up their bodies and attempted to burn their remains in the family fireplace. Halderson is also accused of scattering parts of their bodies around southern Wisconsin. On Wednesday, Judge John Halen confirmed there was no motion for a mistrial by either side and that Halderson had been fully vaccinated for COVID-19. He told jurors court proceedings have been delayed at least until next Tuesday. Someone essential to the proceedings has tested positive. And as a result, everyone who was in the well of the courtroom on both sides um, have taken steps to quarantine. I know other uh, colleagues uh, have tried and have had to uh, postpone or even um, uh, completely reschedule trials. And I think that may be something that occurs further. I asked for six alternates because I was very concerned uh, about you folks during this process. I hadn't anticipated that it, uh, it could cause a delay as far as others, but there are essential uh, persons connected to these proceedings, and we are all undergoing uh, routine um, testing and monitoring of our health, and this is where we are at this point in time. Before news broke of the COVID-19 diagnosis on Tuesday, the prosecution called the medical examiner to the stand who performed the autopsy of victim Bart Halderson's torso. Can you make any determination whether those, that disfigurement or dismemberment occurred before, after Mr. Halderson, Bart Halderson died? So one thing that helps us determine whether or not an injury occurred before or after death is the presence or absence of a vital reaction or hemorrhage. So we've been talking about me finding hemorrhage in areas of injury. In the areas where the gunshot entrance was were, there was hemorrhage around it, indicating that the heart was beating when the, when the individual was shot. Where I recovered bullet fragments, there was hemorrhage or vital reaction surrounding that area. However, in the areas surrounding the dismembered limbs or the head, the upper extremities and the lower extremities, there were injuries, but I did not appreciate this vital reaction. I did not appreciate hemorrhage in the same way that I appreciated around the other injuries. So the uh, mutilation occurred after death. That is correct. Doctor, did you determine a cause of death for Bart, Bart Halderson? I did. And what was that cause of death? As written on page two of my report, I determined the cause of death was gunshot wounds of the torso. And did you determine a manner of death? I did. And what was the manner of death for Bart Halderson? As I'm reading from page two of my report, I assess that the manner of death was homicide. Taylor, how are the pre- and post-humorous humorous, sorry, injuries telling the story of how Bart Halderson was murdered? Well, now we le we've learned some things today. A, we learned that the cause of death was multiple gunshots to his back. So he was shot in the back, and that's what killed him. We also learned 
that the vicious and really absolutely disgusting mutilation occurred post-mortem. Um, we don't have the same answers for the mother. We don't know because we haven't recovered enough of the body to make those determinations yet. But now we know for sure what happened. This was a shooting to the back and then a mutilation post-mortem. And, you know, both sides can use this information to argue effectively now. Now, Terry, what happens if Chandler Holderson is not cleared by the next court date for COVID-19? Could we see a mistrial? Brian, that's a distinct possibility. You know, Judge Hyland has been very careful. He's cautioned the jurors to make sure they don't hear anything outside of the courtroom. But now that we know they will be outside of the courtroom for an indetermined amount of time, they could very well hear something either intentionally or not intentionally about the trial. And you don't want that. It's very important that you protect that barrier because they're only supposed to make their decision based on what evidence they see in trial. And also, the other issue is the longer they're out, the greater the possibility that one of the jurors, God forbid, themselves might get COVID. And of course, that would be a problem as well. You'd have to get one of those alternates to sit in. And you could go through quite a few alternates. So hopefully this you know, delay will not uh, cause a mistrial, but it very well could, Brian. Yeah, it's an unfortunate reality that we live in with COVID times and attempting to try to have trials affecting everyone. Well, thank you both, and thank you for joining us here on Law & Crime Daily. We'll see you next time as we discuss justice in America.